Now, another aspect of the image of God is the usness of the image of God, the usness of it, or the relational aspect of it. Um, let us make man in our image. The us and our are singular or plural. They're plural. Let us make man in our image. So we are made in the image of God, us. Uh, man is built for relationship. And so how do you understand that plurality? Let us make man in our image. There's different ways you can understand it. And this kind of goes through uh, some of those. And let me just start out with the plural of majesty. Um, did your mother ever to say to you, uh, we have decided that you shouldn't be going to this place, okay? We have decided, and the assumption is it's the father and mother decided, but it was really the mother that decided, and she says, we have decided, okay? But kind of like, does she get to say that because she's the mother kind of thing? That, and the implications, the dad's in there. Uh, when a king says, a king says, we have decided, is it really the king making a decision? But it's kind of like, does the king get to use the, what we call the royal we? Does the king get to do that? Yeah, it's like the king says, we have decided. It's really him, but he's the king. In Hebrew, they have a thing called the plural of majesty. Plural of majesty. In English, we've got what? Singular, and that means you've got one of them. Plural means what? Two or more. So we use plurality to assign what? the number of something, whether it's singular or whether it's plural, multiple numbers. In Hebrew, they do singular and plural, but they also have something, when something is really, really, really big, they use the plural, okay? They use the plural when something is really big, this plural of majesty. So you'd have what? Stuff, and then if you want to say the stuff was like really, really big, you'd say what? Stuffs, okay? You'd put an S on it to make it like that. Now for us, when we say stuffs, that means many stuff. But when they say stuffs and stuff, they mean, mean this is big stuff, okay? So, sorry, that I should have used a probably a different word here. But anyway, so do you, do you know what I'm saying with the plural of majesty then? In other words, it's so big that let us make man, God speaking in an us kind of way in the majesty. That's a possibility. That's a possibility based on Hebrew grammar. It could be let us make man. I think there's some other better possibilities here. Heavenly court. Does anybody remember Isaiah chapter 6? God is in his heavenly court, and God asks the question, Who will go for us? Who will go for us? And the plural is used there. God is speaking to these heavenly beings who will go for us. Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord, send me. Does anybody remember Job in the book of Job, the first chapter? God is up there, and he basically says, uh, Hey, have you guys considered my servant Job? And he's talking to the group in the heavenly court. There's an us there, and Satan steps forward and says, Well, hey, Job's good, but he's just good because you bless him with all this stuff. Let me take that away, and he'll curse you to your face. Okay, so this us of the heavenly court. Does that make sense? Let us make man in our image that, that God is talking in the heavenly court. I think there's ramifications both from Job 1 and Isaiah chapter 6 that this may be likely. Okay, I want to put a plus sign here. This is, I think, a real good shot at it. Now, maybe God's talking to himself. Did you ever talk to yourself? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Should we do this? We do that. If we do this, then there's going to be all these consequences. If we do that, then there's going to be all these consequences. What should we do? You talk, do you ever talk to yourself? Okay. Okay, a lot of guys don't talk to yourself. Anyways, I talk to myself. But anyways, and so you could adjust. You could use self-deliberation. What shall we do kind of thing within yourself? What shall we do self-deliberation? By the way, does the Bible have very much self-deliberation like that? Almost never. I don't, yeah, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you right now a passage where you get this God talking to himself kind of thing. So the self-deliberation, I think this is, this is bogus. This is wrong. It rarely ever occurs in Scripture, so I don't think you want to bring that. Some people say the let us make man in our image is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that this is the discussion among the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, and then it's the trinity. A lot of people suggest this, and I'm not ready to say it's wrong, but I ask you, would Moses have understood the trinity? How well would Moses have understood the Trinity? Would Moses have understood Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? As a matter of fact, in the time of Jesus, this is like 1,400, 1,200 years later, in the time of Jesus did they understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when Jesus says he's the Son of God, did they want to stone him and kill him? So what I'm saying is, how well was the Trinity understood back then? I want to say I don't think Moses had a clue on the Trinity very much. 
Yeah, he could have had, but, but the problem is, too, nobody would have known it. I mean, suppose God showed Moses a trinity, but when Moses comes down from the mount, you know, none of those people are going to have a clue what he's talking about because God, in the Old Testament, God is one. The Lord our God is one, and they really pushed that. So I'm not sure how well he knew the trinity. So I'm, what I'm saying is, would Moses have understood this very much? By the way, did the early church, did it take the church 300 years to figure out the trinity? Okay, the early church really wrestled over this thing with the Trinity. So I'm saying, I don't know whether how well Moses said, I don't, the Trinity is, let us make man in our image. Could be, could be, I don't want to eliminate it, but all I'm saying is, I got to get back in Moses' shoes, and I don't think so. Do you want? Uh, what I'm wanting to suggest is that if you start saying Moses is writing down, he has down st things that he has no clue of, you got to be careful with that. Because um, now it's possible he wrote better than he knew. It's possible he wrote better than he knew. But I've got to have some good reason for that. Like he, in other words, if he's telling you something in the future. So it's possible here he wrote better than he knew. I don't want to eliminate this possibility. I'm just saying it. I don't think he understood the Trinity. I, don't, I think this thing, would he have understood the heavenly court? Yes, because the other cultures also had heavenly court ideas, and so the heavenly court idea seems more natural given the historical framework in which he would have been writing. Now, by the way, is it possible that's wrong too? Okay, I wasn't there. I'm, I mean, I'm old, but not that old. And so anyways, what I'm saying is I wasn't there. I don't know. So I want to keep the Trinity, put it in the back burner. I want to bring forward the heavenly court. And then, um, but, but either of these are going to be options. Okay, can we do that without saying we don't know, but... Those are two valid options. This one, thumbs down to. This one here, possible, but I doubt it. I think it's more specific. Uh, by the way, does the us shape us? Is it me or is it us that shapes us? Does your culture shape who you are? Does your culture shape who you are? Does your family background and things shape who you are? To quote somebody and I know, but does it take a village to make a person kind of thing? Does it take a we? Does it take a we to make a, a me? Does it take a we to make a me? Okay? And so what happens is your backgrounds and stuff shape who you are. Are we relationally built? I guess that's what I'm saying. Are we relationally built? Are, does the us build the I? Does the us build the I? And just look around. I mean, all you guys are from different areas. You all come from different backgrounds. And it's shaped you in a different way than other people, which is really neat because we're all unique in that sense. But okay, so the us shaping the I. Human beings, are we built for relationship? I guess that's the point I want to make. Are human beings built for an us context? Yes, okay, we're built from an us context to an us context. So relationships can be really important for the image of God and the shaping of that. Now, this thing with the ruling, uh, let's look at this. The image of God is ruling. Let us make man in our image that in order to rule. In the Old Testament, is God the sovereign? Now, if I say sovereign, what do I mean by sovereign? Is God the king? God is the king. God rules, the, he is the great king. Let me just say this. God is the great king. He puts humankind on earth to what? To rule. Do we rule in the place of God? Are we like, the term I want is vice regents, but are we like, how should I say, a president of the United States rules the United States, but can he really rule everything? No. And so do you have governors in different states ruling in the governors in the states? By the way, are almost all kingdoms set up like this, where you have the great king, and then you have people ruling under him, ruling littler areas under him. And so what you have in this creation account is that God creates humankind in his image to rule over the fish of the air, the birds of the sea, and the creatures that crawl around, that we are actually in God's place ruling over the creation. We are, are, this is, are we little gods, in one sense, little gods ruling over part of his creation? And that has, has God committed, that's maybe a terrible way to say it, that's a terrible way to say it and stuff. You get, but do you see the point? Has God given some of his, his rule over to us to administer? Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Has God given over some of his rule, and we as vice regents rule in behalf of the great king? Okay. Now, how does this uh, get established and things like that? Uh, it's very interesting. The kings of the ancient world would have representatives 
that would rule, and it was you'd have the great king, and the, the, the great king would have uh, sub kings over various areas that the king conquered. And so you basically, uh, kings would have representatives and they would rule in the king's place. They would rule in the king's place. Does anybody remember uh, Cyrus, Darius, and those guys? And they basically had this huge kingdom and things, and they ruled through the various satraps and various things that people ruled under them in the name of Cyrus, in the name of Darius. Okay? And, and it happens to almost every kingdom where you have the big king rules the whole thing, and then these uh, governors... Um, diplomats and things will rule over the other thing. And that's the way it was back in the Syrian times. Notice the emphasis in Genesis 126 is on ruling. Now, does this have huge implications and things of how, what are the implications for this in terms of uh, meaning and destiny? Are humankind built to rule? Um, and this, we are God's vice regents on this earth. Does it matter how we rule the creation? Humankind is given to rule over the birds of the air, fish of the sea, and the humankind is given to rule over the earth. God has given the rule, his rule over to us. Therefore, do human beings need to take care, for example, of the environment? Do the human beings, are we ruling in God's place over God's good earth? Are we ruling over God's good earth? And does it make a difference how we rule in terms of the environment? Therefore, should Christian people be involved in environmentalist type stuff? Now, I'm not a real big tree hugger or anything like that, but do we have a stewardship for ruling over the of animals and over the over the earth of the earth? So therefore, there's a basis for environmentalism. Is there a basis? And environmentalism, right back to the image of God and this rule that we have that God has committed to us over the, over the world. So that's, yeah, Eric? I wouldn't say that we rule in place of God. I would say that God gives us free will to make our own decisions. And we can think, all right, we rule over everything else. Like, like not rule over everything else, but like rule over like the animals and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think that God still has control. Control yeah, yeah, okay. What, what we're, we're talking about here is the relationship between the great king and the king's under him. God controls everything. Yeah. Okay, you got you to work with that. God controls everything. But he's committed some of the control and movement to other people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he still controls that too. Exactly. But, but, but you've got to, but, but, but that, with that ability to rule comes certain responsibilities for us that we are to rule in his place and therefore we have certain responsibilities on how we uh, we manifest, actually, how we manifest the rule of God on this earth, okay, should reflect the glory and goodness of God, but not taking, usurping his power because he's the great king, he rules everything, yeah.